Hi, Francesca. Hello, Frank. Uh, thanks for making the time to, to talk to me. I know how, how busy you've been in the last uh, few weeks, months. So mm. that's much uh, appreciated. My pleasure. I wanted to, to start by quoting a few people. Uh, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, mm -hmm. called what's happening in Gaza a killing of civilians that is unparalleled and unprecedented in any conflict since I have been, or since he has been, Secretary General. The World Health Organization said that disease could kill more people in Gaza than bombs. UNRWA chief, Philippe uh, Lazzarini, said that the situation in Gaza was hell on earth. And finally, Save the Children said that the number of children killed in Gaza, about 6,000 until now, surp surpasses the annual number of children killed across the world's conflict zones since 2019. So my first question to you is, is what's happening in Gaza a massive failure on the behalf of the international community to act and to stop this? Yes, it is. But frankly, Frank, had you asked me this question on the 6th of October, I would have already said yes, because um, before the 6th of October, Gaza, uh, which as you know, has uh, is home to 2.2 million people, half of whom are children, has been entrapped uh, by an Israeli blockade for 16 years, during which there have been five major wars. So it was already depleted, it was already a humanitarian crisis, uh, seven out of 10 people relying on humanitarian aid, 50% of unemployment, 5% of water that was uh, fit for drinking, and 80% of the children displaying depression symptoms. It was already a, a, a pretty dear humanitarian situation before the 6th of, of October. But of course, what has unfolded, I mean, the train of events that has befell Palestinians and Israelis as of the 7th of October required a responsible leadership at the international level. And this requires not only the Secretary General, but the UN Security Council and all member states and this has not, uh, we have not seen it. Voilà. And in a way, what, what kind of message does the inaction, and actually I'll go further, further than that, because it's not only inaction on, on the behalf of the international community. And when I talk about the international community, I'm not talking about the people, I'm talking about states. It's actually support. It goes further than, you know, and then just not actually Act, they're actually actively supporting what's happening. We know about the US $3 billion per year. So what kind of signal does this send to the rest of the world uh, and even more so the, the, the South, you know? Yeah. And again, yes, absolutely. Look, I've, I've often heard the metaphor of uh, Israel-Palestine Israel like uh, uh, Goliath versus David, where... Um, the Palestinians are confronting this this giant, this very um, powerful um, entity. But I say it's not just, it's David versus many Goliaths, because in fact, Israel has never been alone and has not acted alone. And what Israel has done, and let me, speci let me be specific, Israel has maintained, just if we stay within the occupied Palestinian territory, okay, we do not delve into history, 1947, 1948, we stay in the territory that Israel has occupied as of 1967, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem. Israel has been able to maintain an occupation that has transformed into or has served as the vehicle to build colonies after colonies. And co building colonies in occupied territories is a war crime. And of course, this has become the backbone of the structural violence that is so dominant in the, in the occupied Palestinian territory. So there has been steadily dispossession, forced displacement, and, and crimes committed against the Palestinians. Um, of course, this doesn't justify, this doesn't downplay the, the crimes that Palestinians might have committed while they were trying to, uh, uh, to set themselves free from this oppressive regime, which is, of course, apartheid by default. 
but the international community has not upheld its obligations to realize Palestinian self-determination, even when there was a commitment for the two-state solution. It's been, the two-state solution has been an, an empty mantra, like an empty box. Yes, there will be one day a Palestinian state, while over 30 years, Israel has continued to build colonies after colonies, eating up what remained of the land of, of the Palestinians for the, for the setup of, of an independent sovereign state. So, you know, there has been this uh, uh, action uh, even in the form of, of this support, even in the form of inaction uh, for a long time. And now it's clearly, it's shocking because it's true, as the Secretary General has said, but already weeks ago, Gaza is the graveyard for children. It is at a global level because 6,000 children killed in the in the Gaza Strip alone in 50 days, this is catastrophic. This is something that my mind cannot even, like many, cannot even retain and comprehend. So it's it's shocking. And now, yes, now there are diseases that risk to make as many deaths as those who are being killed by Israeli bombs, without even naming what's happening in the in in the West Bank. But this is why it's still there's. There is still a small window. There is still a possibility to stop all this. But the international community, so the United Nations, the members of the United Nations, and particularly the global north, needs to get its act together. Because the global south see what's happening. Palestine has always been emblematic of not just the, the, the conflict over the land, which is anachronistic and, yeah, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. But this is the fight between the global north and the global south, where the rules so powerfully wanted and enforced by the global north do not apply when it comes to the Palestinians, like too many in the global south. Thanks, Francesca. You've, you've mentioned a few things. And, uh, and as, you well know, to, as you well know, to be able to do what Israel is doing now, it had to go through this like dehumanizing process uh, about the Palestinians for years, obviously, but even more so in the last few weeks. Um, so you recently said that um, the mainstream media lives in an alternative reality. And I've heard you said like the occupied territories and you mentioned Gaza. What I've heard again, like every two years when Israel bombs Gaza in the mainstream media, including with like so-called expert, is that Gaza is not occupied anymore. We left, I mean, the settlers left in 2005. What's also what Israel is also saying that Gaza is an um, enemy entity. You, an international law expert, can you explain what an enemy entity means and if it means anything under international law? And then can you explain if Gaza is actually still occupied today? Yes, let me explain this, and then I would like to go back, if you allow me, to the concept of alternative reality, because it sounds bombastic, but it is what it is. I really mean it. So I cannot explain, unfortunately, what uh, enemy entity means, because it means nothing under international law. But again, in my view and my experience, uh, Israel tends to uh, craft its own categories and definitions to evade the application of international law as it is in its purest form. Because think, for example, of the precedent, which is quite interesting, of the occupied Palestinian territory. Now, I mean, the United Nations have defined the territory, the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, together with other parts of the territories in the region that Israel occupied in 1967 as occupied because there is a there was a military control by Israel over these territories. And this has not changed. So it's occupied under international law. And defining this as occupied allows uh, for the application of international uh, relevant framework, which is international humanitarian law law of occupation and law of wars, the Geneva Convention. Israel disputes that this land is occupied and call it disputed. And by doing so, it avoids the application of international humanitarian law in its entirety. And in fact, Israel says, no, we do apply humanitarian provisions that in any case have never been defined. However, 
There is no question that the territory is occupied. It has also been confirmed by the International Court of Justice in 2004, and Gaza is also occupied. Now, the difference between Gaza, is Jerusalem, and, uh, and West Bank, is Jerusalem is also peculiar because it's considered annexed. But however, the main difference between Gaza and the rest of the occupied Palestinian territory is the presence of the colonies. The colonies that were withdrawn forcefully and with much violence, which, by the way, it's regrettable because then it has caused many other problems. But however, uh, during Sharon's um, government, the settlers who were in Gaza were removed. And since then, um, Israel claims that it no longer occupies Gaza. But you know, the colonies are not a determinant uh, for the, the, the existence of a military occupation. In order to have a military occupation, according to the Hague regulation, you need to have uh, an, an armies, uh, an alien armies, um, effective control. So back in the days in when the Hague regulations were written, effective control could only be exercised through to troops on the ground. Today is different because you can exercise control by other means. And so well, although Israel doesn't have troops on the ground, and it, it's, it's true that since, 19, uh, since 2000, uh, 2006, um, 2005, 2006, Hamas has become, uh, this Gaza has become Hamas's kingdom. At the same time, the occupation is maintained in, in, through various measures. First of all, the, the, um, the closure, the blockade, which allows Israel to control all the land access, all the, the, um, the sea access, but also the sea, because there is territorial water that the, Gaza, the people in Gaza cannot use. Uh, Israeli boats patrols the, the, the Gaza Sea. But also there is control of the aerial space, the electromagnetic space, whatever enters and exits Gaza, which means Israel controls how much food, how much water, how much medicines the people in Gaza have. But also the currency. There is the shekel because even the taxes as they are determined and possibly retained by Israel. And all the more, Israel reserves itself the right to strike Gaza, to carry out preventative strikes, which means to hit and bombard Gaza. What kind of right is it? And if it's not this occupation, what do we need? There's, there's alternative reality, and that's really part of the the complicity in a way of the mainstream corporate media in brainwashing people to believe that uh, Gaza is not occupied anymore, that you know the Palestinians don't want peace, they want to kill Israelis, that they saw a goal in life. But there's also the thing is, so when you have actually voices like yours and like many others that want to actually explain what the real reality is, these voices are being silenced or we try to silence them. You've been a victim of like this massive propaganda by the by sort of the Israeli state and, and supporters. And um, so in a way, why do you think um, why do you think they want to silence the voice that actually uh, speak the truth? Um, these voices took the, the, the bubble of the alternative reality. So let me spend just a few minutes on the alternative reality that uh, corporate media, mainstream media, and Western countries in general try to impose. This is the reality they try to impose. And it's very much, it's made by three main elements, the what, the how, and when um, the question of Israel and Palestine comes up in, uh, in the public discourse, uh, which is to completely, the reality is completely transformed. So there is the what, and in general, let's say, the Western media tends to capture only certain facts. So for example, there is a, all often reference to an escalation of violence in the, in the occupied Palestinian territory. But violence is not something that flares up all of a sudden, but all of a sudden, violence, violence is structural. And the fact that they omit the context and they, they, they historicize 
the, the reality in the occupied Palestinian territory, so they never talk about the occupation. I mean, I, I sometimes I find myself embarrassed because the media naturally omit the word occupation, which is also part of the mandate. And I say, no, it's occupied. Let's talk about that. So there is no occupation. There is no colonization. And so the settlers and the Palestinians are sort of on the same ground fighting on the land. No, excuse me. One part of the population shouldn't be there in the first place. And the fact that it is doesn't mean that they become a target. Huh? They're still, for me, civilians, and uh, and so they should be protected. But the whole endeavor is illegal, and it's never projected as such. Uh, and and also, Gaza is not occupied. Gaza is this enemy entity. So there is a tendency to reproduce the narrative that is offered by Israel, which is not impartial in this in this context. Then there is the how. The how is connected to the point I just make, because look, for example, uh, when and just to mention one recent thing, but when there was the liberation of the hostages, the the, the, the Israeli hostages were uh, children while the uh, the Palestinians were minors or other people under 18. Excuse me, these are also children and there is, it's so dehumanizing and it's also the fact that, for example, we know everything, everything of these poor people who have been killed, the Israelis who have been killed and taken hostage by uh, by Hamas. We know everything. I mean, we've seen pictures. We know where they live. We know their names. Uh, why, why this doesn't happen? Palestinians are numbers at best. And there is a flattening of their humanity, which builds on the dehumanization of the Palestinians that has built into the, yeah, let's say the, 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 the Israeli government's, Israeli government's narrative. And then there is the when. Again, there is very limited attention span, but in general, you hear talking about Israel and Palestine, where there is massive violence that targets also the Israelis. So this is why I say it's not that you, they live in an alternative reality in retrospect. They construe an alternative reality, and they try to feed it to the large public, who clear, who's clearly confused. Uh, one of the talking points of the Israelis and the mainstream media, if, if Hamas didn't exist, if rockets weren't flying from Gaza to Israel, everything would be fine. So what I want you to talk about now is what's happening in the West Bank, what's been happening in the West Bank since the start of the year, uh, but also what's happening in the West Bank more especially now. In the West Bank, Hamas exists, of course, as a political movement, but there's no rockets flying from the West Bank to Israel. Um, oh. But can you talk about the actions of the, the army, the state, but also of settlers in the West Bank in the last few weeks? No, absolutely. But also, let's challenge that, uh, that issue of if Hamas was not there throwing rockets, because... Uh, the Israel has man, had already maintained the occupation of the West Bank, is Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip for 20 years when Hamas uh, came to life. And also Hamas would not be the, the force it is today and wouldn't constitute the danger it poses today to Israel and to the Palestinians, first and foremost in Gaza. Um hadn't it been for Israel's support and encouragement, because until a couple of months ago, for a long time, Israeli leaders, including Netanyahu and Smodrich, have been on record saying that Hamas was an asset and the Palestinian Authority was a liability. This is just to put things in context. But exactly, precisely what is happening in the West Bank shows the, the weakness of Hamas being the threat argument. Because there is no Hamas military presence in the in the West Bank, and still, since the 7th of October, uh, thousands of Palestinians have been arbitrarily arrested and detained, including many children. And this is a trend that, again, is not new. There were already 5,000 Palestinian prisoners, 80% uh, of them illegally detained in Israel outside of the occupied Palestinian territory, 1,200 without a charge, without trial. But again, the trial would be through a military court. But then what has happened is that 
there has been um, an increasing of, of violence, also probably the reflex of, uh, of um, incitement and hatred against the Palestinians um, as of the 7th of October. 220 Palestinians have been killed, as, uh, at, uh, at least, because then the, the numbers keep on going up. And 60 of them are children. This is why, Frank, have been calling for months, actually, since the beginning of my mandate, for a protective presence in the occupied Palestinian territory, because it's clear that Israel has relinquished its obligation, its duty to ensure the protection of the Palestinians as, uh, as uh, civilians. Uh, it considers Palestinians a, a hostile entity I mean, in general, and um, and uh, uh, a security threat to to Israel because Israel confuses its own security, the security of its territory and its citizens, with the security of its annexation plan and its expansion over what remains of historical Palestine. But this is the reality that needs to be halted. Thanks, Francesca. My, my final question is that is is two in one in a way. Is how. Do we make sure, as activists, as, as scholars, as international law experts, that this moment, which is the, one of the gravest moments we've all had yeah. to experience in our, our life, lifetime, if you're like between like, you know, whatever, 10 and 50 yeah. or 60, how do we make sure this moment actually does change everything? And how do we potentially get to, to peace? Because people say, like, you know, how do we get to peace? So that, that would be my final question yeah it's two questions in one uh because i i do think that this is a watershed moment um or might be a watershed moment and unfortunately uh it seems that we the humankind are incapable to change trajectory and to do better without these watershed moments, without these tragedies. But, you know, I often bring the example, which is very dear to me, which is very close to me as an Italian and as a European, because my countries partook in the, in the genocide of, of the Jews during the Holocaust. All the shame is on Germany, and for a number of reasons, but Italy was not far away from that, and there were so many... Uh, of our citizens who were sent to die because they were Jews. Now, the Holocaust would have not been possible without the centuries of persecutions of the Jews, without the centuries of discrimination against them, of racism and, um, and dehumanization of them. And if we look at other cases in, in Rwanda, for example, the, the discriminations against the Tutsi had been there for a long time and mounted and mounted till it became genocidal violence. And there are many cases around the world that carries this extremely serious example. Now, the situation is, I think, that the 7th of October, with the 7th of October, the status quo is gone doesn't exist anymore. And it has been tragic for the Israelis and it has been tragic for the Palestinians. But this is why in the first uh, hours of, of uh, soon after the 7th of October, in one of my first interviews, I said, and I remain convinced that this is what the international community should have done or should do. It's to be even-handed and act with wisdom toward the Palestinians and the Israelis. And forget for a second, what is politically convenient? Think that these people cannot live without rights, without freedom, and without dignity, all of them. And uh, this is where we are now. There, we are at the point where we can make it happen. We can help the Palestinians and Israelis get there. But what does peace mean? Peace can be, in its crudest form, the absence of war, the absence of hostilities. And this is what we need to achieve today, tomorrow, next week, meaning end of the hostilities in Gaza, not a revival of bombing, because the Gazas are already desperate as they are. And I think that we still don't know how much desperate is their situation. Um, but then there is the construction of a peace which is not just the absence of war. It's a place where people feel 
the, the harmony of, of, of living of um, and, and enjoy life in a peaceful place that they can call home. And for that, I'm afraid that much more than just goodwill is needed. There is also need for time to pass and, and the emotions that are now very high to pause for people to look at what they have done, all of them, without distinction. And then, but again, there is a powerful intervention from the international community that needs to happen because otherwise, I mean, we will not get there and will be a continuation of hostility and violence. Thanks, Francesca. It was uh, it yeah, yeah, amazing to talk to you. And uh, and uh, and thanks for everything you've been doing in the last. I mean, since your mandate started, I think it's um, it's a hell of a job. And you know, I I I got to be very close to some of your predecessors. You know, John Dugard, Richard Falk, and and I know they've you know they faced the same um, you know criticism than you have. But you have to keep you know you have to keep going. And I uh, you know I think it's uh, it's brilliant that you still you know. Yeah, yeah, of course, of not, course, but not bulging. I believe. I believe that human rights, uh, human rights people, not just human rights lawyers, yeah. but human rights people are selfless. Mm. So, frankly, yes, there is a lot of attacks against me, but there is much more support and yeah. love. And I, more than anything else, I know that I'm, I'm, I'm doing it for, for justice and human yeah. rights, which is really something worth living for. Thanks, Francesca.